Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. <clears throat> There's Jerry over there. This is stuff you should know. I'm so sick there. of my voice right now. I just looked over almost to check to see if Jerry was there. Even though this room is so small, she's always visible. Right. I don't know why I did that. How are you? I'm okay. It's a dude. It's my voice, man. It's driving me crazy. What's I'm wrong? so wound up and caffeinated and... Oh, yeah? We just talked about dark money. Oh, yeah. Blah. Maybe we should have recorded that last. Maybe. Maybe you could have just done uh, power lifting for the rest of the day <laughs> in the gym. That's what I do. Uh, power lifter. So we did an episode. In Wait, the... I'm not done talking about power lifting. Oh, okay, go ahead. I'm just kidding. I don't want to interrupt you. Uh, November 2014, we did an episode on collective hysteria. Yes. Not too long ago. What is collective hysteria? Yeah, and it was a good one. Was that a shot at me just now? Because I interrupt you a lot. Was what a shot? That no. you don't want to interrupt me. No. Because I interrupt you. I've, it's part of the show. Okay. I don't mean to, <laughs> and I feel badly when I notice it. Oh, really? Yeah. How often do you notice it? I would say six-tenths of the time. Okay. So three-fifths is another way to put that. I can live with that. Um, it was a good episode, but we did not cover... There are a lot of cases of mass hysteria, and we only covered a small portion. Yeah. We're not going to go in depth about what mass hysteria is. If you want that, go listen to that episode, which is a good one, if I remember correctly. Yeah. We yeah. should talk about it a little bit. Sure, because I think there's stuff in here that we didn't even cover about the overall thing, or at mm -hmm. least it didn't seem familiar to me. Right. Uh, so it's also called mass psychogenic illness, collective delusions, um, conversion disorder. What else? Um. <laughs> you need to duplicate that though with like 10 Josh's doing it at once. That's a gif right there. Maybe Jerry could do that. She says she can. Uh, it's a real thing though. And basically it is when um, people have physical symptoms of something without there being a physical cause. Not only that. So that's a psychosomatic illness. True. For a mass psychogenic illness, the psychosomatic illness is catching. Yes. It's a, an epidemic, a, an infection of imagined illness. That's right. Which That's... is pretty awesome. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, not when you're going through it and you're suffering, because the people who are suffering are actually experiencing suffering. Yeah. Like, they're, they, it might be made up, it might be all in their heads, but to them, it's quite real. Yeah, but the, it is sociologically and psychologically. Psychologically. Speaking, I'm sick, people, so I apologize if I'm not talking good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, psychologically speaking and sociologically, it's just, like, utterly fascinating. To sure, me. yeah. Um, one thing that happens is it's usually triggered by some sort of stress. Sure, uh, some sort of emotional trigger. Yeah, and it usually happens in very close-knit communities, um, often among young women. Yeah. They're very susceptible to it, apparently. Perhaps isolated communities. Yeah. And then communities of people who are fairly high on the totem pole in that they don't have a lot of social status necessarily or a lot of say in their own lives. Yeah. Um, and they, uh, this is a means of saying there's something very wrong in my world. Yes. That's people who study these things. That's what they've come up with. Like I've got no voice, but I can break out in a rash. I can bark like a dog and make <laughs> you do it too. Exactly. That's power. So uh, the outcome supposedly for this, for getting over this, is better in children than adults, even though more children are stricken with it. Right. It seems like than adults. Yeah. But that makes total sense. Like a kid's more likely to follow along with the crowd, but then also be like, what are we just having a rash about? <laughs> like, let's go play Nintendo. Right. So let's all go play Nintendo. Because it's 1987. I wish I had an old NES, like the original one, and yeah. a copy of Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. That's all you need. Yeah. I was into uh, the whatever that first Mario game was, where it was the big world. Yeah, Super Mario Brothers. Was that it, Super Mario Brothers? Yeah, that was a good one, too. Yeah. And then Metroid. Did you play Metroid? I don't think so. I didn't play a ton oh, of man, that was so well NES. Done. But I played, what was the first, really, not Sega, was it the first PlayStation that had Street Fighter? No, I think or Sega had Nintendo? Street Fighter. 
I can't remember what it was. All I remember is that there was the one Sega year. Sega Genesis maybe had Street Fighter. No, nah, it wasn't Sega Genesis. I don't know. That. This dude I knew in college had Street Fighter and uh, Mortal Kombat. Yeah, Mortal Kombat was definitely. It might have been Super Nintendo, or or Nintendo sixty four. Did you play Goldeneye? Oh yeah, man, that was the first great first person yeah. shooter. It was so well done. Yeah, but I just remember listening to Dr. Dre's The Chronic and playing Street Fighter <laughs> and that was it. Mortal Kombat for a year solid. Right. And I think I went to school and made grades in a classes. Good going. In a classes. That's nice, man. Man, I need a nap. You want to talk about some mass hysterias? Yes. You want to talk about nuns in the Middle Ages? Yeah. So in in uh the mid- in medieval times, not the restaurant no, but maybe there too. Um, <laughs> if you had a uh, sister or a niece or a, an aunt or somebody who was a rightful heir to the estate that you wanted, yeah, well, there weren't mental asylums at the time, <clears throat> so you couldn't commit them, but you could have them sent to a convent or a nunnery. Wow. So like a brother could do that to a sister? Oh, yes. Unbelievable. Yeah, so you could take, you could usurp that that uh, inheritance that was rightfully theirs, or if you had a daughter who was um, unattractive or yeah. possibly disfigured, uh, you could say, uh, "I don't want the world to see you. I'm going to send you a convent or a nunnery." And it sounds pretty bad, and in a lot of cases it was. Sure, but it also was a good deal for a lot of young women because they would get a high quality education. Yeah, they could pursue creative interests like drawing and painting and sewing or whatever floated their boat. Yeah, sexy outfits. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, so it wasn't it wasn't all bad, but it, I I was like, why did did anybody get sent to convents? And and that was why to either get wow. rid of them or to give them an education that they otherwise wouldn't have had. But these these places were very strict and tight-knit, sure. and so they were ripe for uh, mass psychogenic illnesses. Yeah, I bet if like your daughter like kissed a boy that you didn't like, you could, you know, if you're worried about that. Off to the convent. Off to the nunnery. Uh, so we're going to talk about a couple of cases with nunneries, but uh, in medieval times, there were more than 100 cases of mass hysterias breaking out. It happened a lot. There was one in Spain in the 1500s where uh, nuns bleated like sheep and had convulsions. Sweet. One in France in 1491 where they yelped like dogs. Okay. Uh, and then this one in France where uh, <clears throat> all of a sudden one day a nun started meowing like a cat. Yes. And, and it caught on. It caught on like wildfire. <laughs> Apparently in this convent, by if, within a few days, all of the nuns were meowing. And it was loud, like the neighbors could hear it. Yeah, and not only meowing, but it became, they meowed in unison. It became structured right? Uh, with their meowing. So for a few hours a day, they would all get together and meow. That's right. <laughs> Which, imagine just like stopping by on your travels because you you heard this one convent has really good roasted turkey leg. Sure. And you show up and yeah. you enter <laughs> Into a giant room filled with nuns all meowing in unison. Yeah, that one might have been some guy's idea of a good time. <laughs> I guess so. You know? You just kind of make a face and go help yourself to a turkey leg and kick back and watch the weirdos meow. Well, here's one of the problems, though. In medieval times in France, cats were not well regarded. They were thought to be of the devil. Yeah. Uh, and so if you're meowing like a cat is a nun, it's not good. They also believed in uh, demonic possession. And um, so they brought in some soldiers who said, we're going to whip you and beat you unless you stop meowing. <laughs> and it worked. And they stopped meowing. Yep. Hooray. But it, that, that's a really important point, that there is a, a widespread belief that you could become possessed. Yeah. So in that, it provides this platform that removes individual responsibility. Yeah. And that is a basis of this, the, the, for the person to really experience it and take it away from a, an act of their own willpower and rather be a sufferer of some yeah. weird illness is a belief that something like this could possibly happen. And so they were possessed rather than them just meowing and going along with the crowd or whatever. Yeah. They were instead possessed at the time. And so their responsibility was removed and therefore they could really give themselves over to it. Yeah. 
I think that's a hallmark of a mass psychogenic illness. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it also happened in Germany, not the meowing, but in the 15th century, a nun bit another nun uh, in the convent. And then I don't know if that nun in turn bit another, but they started biting one another. Yes. A lot. Yeah. And that didn't just stick around that nunnery. It spread all over <clears throat> Germany. And they were worried that there was like an actual infection going on. Yeah, that would cause you to go crazy and bite people. Right. And not only did it spread to Germany, Chuck, it also spread to Rome even. All the way to Rome. Yeah. Um, and then apparently they stopped biting when they got really tired. Yeah. That was the end of that. That seems like a very ham-fisted follow-up. Wouldn't you be like, that was a weird week? Yeah, they probably did. I w- but I mean, like, yeah, it's very interesting that mass psychogenic illnesses in and of themselves are very interesting. But I'm also interested in the transition back to yeah. normalcy. How do you, how do groups that go through that, like, work that out together? Oh, or totally. do they just separate? No, I don't know. Like you said, that'd be totally weird to be like, hey, remember last week when we were all meowing? <laughs> yeah. That was so weird. Yeah. And where are all of our roasted turkey legs? All right, meow. Let's uh, <laughs> move on. To the kissing bug scare of 1899, uh, triatomine bugs. Uh, they look sort of like stink bugs. Yeah. Uh, but they carry a parasite that can cause a disease called uh, Chagas disease. Right. And Chagas disease wasn't described until 1906 or 09. And this kissing bug outbreak was 1899 in yeah. the United States. And a kissing bug is called that because they uh, bite you, they feast on your blood yes. through your lips, which has only three layers of skin, whereas the rest of your face has about 16 layers of skin. Yeah, or your eyelids. Sure. So it's easily penetrated, and the bug will just sit there and suck on you while you're sleeping. But it has a little parting gift for you afterward. When it finishes feasting on your blood through your lips, it turns around and poops on the hole that it made on your mouth or I your knew, eyelid. I knew that was coming. And in doing so, it can infect you with Chagas disease. Yeah, no good. Uh, if you live in the upper one-third of the United States, you don't have to sweat it. No. Uh, basically, draw a line from the top of California all the way across the United States. Uh-huh. And anything below that, um, you might have kissing bugs. So by 1899, this bug was well-known to science already, but it wasn't popularly known. Yeah. So it was an exotic, weird species. And a couple of cases of Chagas disease did sprout up but what spread this thing and turned it into a mass psychogenic illness was newspaper reporting yeah and this is this one's a little bit different it seems like most of these cases of mass hysteria were pretty confined but this one is a clear indication of people having a maybe a mosquito bite or any a bed bug maybe and itching at it and then seeing something on the news and then saying oh no i, I got bit by the kissing bug right and and so part of it Part of what it was attributed to, and actually the guy who was the head of the uh, entomology for the USDA at the time said that this was, he called it a newspaper epidemic. Yeah. And it was because the newspaper reporting so clearly described the symptoms that a person's imagination could create these symptoms in himself or herself. And so they started collecting bugs. Like if somebody was bit by a bug or even saw a bug in their house, they'd be like, oh, God, a kissing bug. Yeah. Catch it and send it off to like the USDA for analysis. And the USDA got everything from like house flies to bumblebees. <laughs> a lot of bugs. From people who were worried that they were, um, they were, they'd broken out in this kissing disease. Yeah. And the good news is, uh, <clears throat> it stopped when the newspaper stopped writing about it. Yeah. Everyone was like, oh, it's just a bumblebee. And it happened in the 1890s, and the 1890s were a really, really weird decade. Um, there was a lot of death cults that sprang up around Ooh. the around the uh, the world. Yeah. But um, there there was a. Have you ever read that book, Wisconsin Death Trip? No. It is crazy, man. It's basically this really artful collection of newspaper clippings from Wisconsin in the 1890s. Wow. And assembled it it paints one of the grimmest bleakest pictures of humanity ever of of civilized humanity just the worst stuff happened to these people they did the worst things to one another they just endured so much wow. and it was a really a really good example of what happened in the 1890s something weird happened that decade crazy you should check that book out it's neat to just look through have you seen the witch yet 
Uh, tomorrow. Oh, man. It's so good. don't tell me anything. Uh, so speaking of the witch, actually, Chuck, I want to give a plug um, to Cinema Jaw. Yeah. So you were on Cinema Jaw um, uh, like a few months back. Yeah, it's a great movie podcast. It is. And um, I was on it recently, and they, their episode that came out on Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday, and we talked about missing persons. Ooh. Like we did tie into our episode. Nice. Um, what, what movies did you talk about? Uh, we talked about The Lady Vanishes. Yeah, Missing with uh, Jack Lemmon? No, not that one, because yeah. I haven't seen it. Okay. Um, have you ever seen The Vanishing, the original one from oh, the yeah. 80s? Yeah. The Franco-Dutch production? Yeah, that was the, the superior version. Right. So I'd only seen the Jeff Bridges... Kiefer Sutherland. Right, yeah. which I liked, but then I started reading up on it, and I was like, oh, this sucks compared to the original? Let if me watch that. there's a Dutch that. version of anything before, then it's probably better. It was so good, dude. Yeah. I was watching it via YouTube on my TV, so it couldn't have been more grainy. Right. It was in spoken French with Dutch subtitles, with English subtitles haphazardly slapped over the Dutch subtitles. And it still And I was out. still like, oh, <laughs> yeah. man, this is so good. Good movie. It was very good. Well, I but, can't wait to hear that episode. Yeah, go check it out. And see The Witch tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. They, they, did a a review, they did a review of The <laughs> Witch, and I put the phone down. Oh, really? And just went, like, I, I could just barely hear that they were still talking. And when they finished, I put the phone back up for the interview. Yeah, it's good to see horror <laughs> movies. And I don't even know if you want to call it a horror movie, but movies like that coming back. With, like, The Babadook and It Follows. Like, people are making good quality movies now. I didn't like The Babadook. Oh, man. I thought it was great. A lot of people did. It's got high yeah. ratings on Netflix. All right. Well, let's take a break. Maybe we'll just come back and talk about movies for the rest of the show. Man Alive. Stuff you should know. Hey everyone, this episode of Stuff You Should Know is brought to you by our friends at Squarespace. Squarespace is the best way, in our opinions, to create the perfect website, and right now is the perfect time to create that website. Yeah, you can turn your cool new idea into a hot new website this summer, right Chuck? And you'll have a beautiful website to showcase your work, blog, or publish content. You can sell products and stuff. They support just about everything you want to do with your site. They have beautiful templates created by world-class designers. They have powerful e-commerce functionality, mm -hmm. lets you sell anything you want. Everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box. Yeah, plus there's built-in search engine optimization and, Chuck, and if you start to get lost, there's 24-7 award-winning customer support. Check it out at squarespace.com, and when you're ready to launch, use our offer code STUFF, and you can save 10%. <laughs> All right, we're back. We are so back. To talk about the Halifax Slasher of 1938. Halifax, England, not Nova Scotia. That's what I thought at first. Me too. Nova Scotia. I didn't know there was two Halifaxes. I didn't either. Um, Halifax in November 1938, uh, there was a woman named... Um, two women. Two women, Gertie Watts and Mary Gledhill, uh, were taking a little walk after work at their mill. Uh, I guess they were walking home, and they said a man came out and slashed us with a knife with Look a at razor. Yeah, we're bleeding, for God's sake. Look at me. Blood. There's blood. Uh, go find this creep. Right. That's what they told the cops. And the cops were like, wah, 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 wah? <laughs> a slasher. <laughs> right. So they started looking for the guy and never found any trace of him. And it was like kind of a thing for a little while, but it really became a thing Five days later, when another woman came to the police station and said, look at this, some guy just came by and slashed my wrist. Yes, that was Mary Sutcliffe, and she supposedly fought him off even right. and gave a very clear description of what he looked like. So the newspapers are like, uh, I think there might be a slasher at large. And within the next five days, several more people came forward. Uh, and came to the police station or came to the newspapers with stories about how they'd been slashed by some anonymous stranger. Yeah. And Halifax was freaked out. Sure. They compared the same fear and panic to uh, what was experienced during the Jack the Ripper era. Yeah. Um, people were just nervous that, that somebody was going to slash them. Yeah. The, the soccer hooligans started beating people up. Like, yeah. that guy didn't look right. He looks like a slasher to me. That's what soccer hooligans do. Or a West Ham fan. Let's go take him down. Uh-huh. 
Um, and it became a real problem. Uh, there's a couple of things, though. One, the slashes, he wasn't a very good slasher. No. These were all very superficial cuts. Right. Uh, no one was severely wounded at all in no. any of the cases. No. So, But it was still confounding, and people yeah. were still scared. He could be a bad slasher. <laughs> right. Still creepy. He could improve. He so we better call better. Scotland Yard, and they did. And Scotland Yard sent two detectives, and the detectives said, well, let us start interviewing witnesses. And the moment they did, they found that the witnesses' stories just started crumbling. Well, first of all, none of the descriptions matched. Right. So they thought at first the dumb cops in Halifax thought, well, maybe there's multiple slashers. Right. Scotland Yard said, no, there's not multiple slashers. No. There's not one slasher. They're like, they would have known that in Nova Scotia. Uh, the final lady, Beatrice Sorrell, said uh, they finally, I guess they put the bright light in her eyes, and she said, I did it myself after having a row with my boy uh, after she discovered she was pregnant. Uh, she had bought a new razor blade and said, I held hold of the blade in my right hand yeah. and slashed down my left arm, making yeah. a, a long cut in my Macintosh coat and cardigan. And I know what you're thinking. It's a waste of a good cardigan. Sure. And <laughs> Macintosh. Whatever that is. I think it's a raincoat. Is it? That sounds about right. Yeah, I think so. A Mac. The Mac. No, I think a Mac is a raincoat because the Beatles song, Eleanor Rigby. The Mac. He never wears a Mac in the pouring rain. Very strange. Bam. Man, I never realized that. All right. So a Macintosh coat. <laughs> I hope it's a raincoat. Uh, then she said, I then put the blade back into the cut. And scratched down my arm twice and put my fingers through the cut in the cloth. Uh. I saw that they were covered in blood. The reason why I cut my arm was because I was in a temper and had been reading in the papers about girls being slashed. So she, I guess, was in a temper. And it wasn't just her. Like ten, uh, nine of the 12 victims eventually confessed to doing it themselves. Um, and this, this, this is a weird mass psychogenic illness. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because these people are slashing themselves, they're not like catching something they yeah. think is is making them dizzy or whatever. They're cutting themselves and then going to the police and saying a slasher did it. I guess for attention, maybe. Well, they did get attention. They got attention in jail. Yeah, they served a whole whopping four weeks. Still, if you're like a normal, ordinary citizen who slashes herself or himself um, just for attention, yeah. four weeks in jail is going to be a problem. That'll set you right. I wouldn't want to do four weeks in jail. Um, the thing is, Chuck, is I could not find whether the first two victims were actually slashed at. I don't think so. They didn't show up in, as far as I know, they weren't ones that confessed. Oh, right. And th I didn't see that they got any jail time. So did somebody initially get attacked and it led to the slasher scare or yeah. did they do it themselves or to each other? That's a good point. Uh, I don't the, know. The Halifax Courier on December 2nd said, carry on Halifax. The slashing scare is over. The theory that a half-crazed, wild-eyed man has been wandering around attacking helpless women in dark streets is exploded. Waka waka. <laughs> man, I wish I... People talked so much better back then. Um, I was in a temper. <laughs> the case I slashed exploded. through my Macintosh. Man. Uh, this is not the only slasher uh, mass hysteria epidemic. Oh, yeah? What but else? There's one in uh, Taipei, Taiwan in the 50s where there's this... Basically, this idea that there was a slasher walking around. And this one was more akin to the kissing bug thing, where people who had cuts on themselves, you know, you'll get a cut every once in a while and be yeah. like, where did I get that cut? On my thumb right now. Okay. If you had been susceptible to this Taipei, Taiwan, 1950s slasher scare, yeah. you may have gone to the police and been like, I, I was slashed. Because, and this one was a little more legitimate to me, the the idea behind the slasher was he would brush past you in a crowd and you wouldn't even notice you'd been slashed until later. Ooh. So that that was sneaky slash. Yeah, it was that that's the better of the slasher mass psychogenic illnesses between that and Halifax, if you ask me. Agreed. Uh I wonder if Tina Fey was a part of that. You know that's how she got that scar. Which scar? She has a scar on her face and uh she was slashed when she was a kid playing in her front yard Jeez. by some random crazy. I didn't know that. And that's kind of all the information that's out there. She, I think, admitted that in an interview and just that was the story. Slashing, it's, that's a terrible crime. Yeah, it just sounds like. Seeking to disfigure somebody? Yeah. It's like throwing acid on their face or something. 
Do you remember that um, Saturday Night Live? Mel Gibson was on. It was back in the eighties, and it, it was set in the old West. And he was like an old West like gunslinger. I think a sheriff. But his thing was um, rather than guns, he threw acid. <laughs> <laughs> It was like Matt Acid or something like that. That's fantastic. It was, um, and, and he got in a, a gunfight with somebody. He like throws acid on him, and they didn't show the the acid being like thrown on the guy. It just showed the crowd's reaction, and they were all like, <laughs> "Oh God, that's awful." Oh, that's great. Don't you hate it when you get a scene from a movie in your head and you can't pinpoint where it's from? Yeah, I got one right now. Let's of- hear it. There's there's a scene where a guy gets slashed in right under the eye as like a parting shot. Like these two dudes were going to fight and it doesn't happen. Uh, and the guy just slashes a guy and the walks. The Princess Bride. No. Yes, it is. It's not the Princess Bride. King Humperdinck gets it. Or Prince Humperdinck gets it from somebody. That's not the one I'm thinking. No. Well, that happens. Are so, you sure that's not the one you're thinking? Yeah. Somebody will write in and tell me. It was like. They were faced off and were gonna fight, and then they and the guy had a knife, I think on his knuckle, and then at the very end, oh, I know, platoon. Oh, got it. Tom Berenger and Charlie Sheen. He cuts Charlie. He, he Sheen? had the he had the blade on his knuckle and he had it right in his eye and he was gonna punch him. Man, and they all talked him down and right at the very end he just went slash and slashed Tom, him Tom. under the eye. Well, platoon and Princess Bride are virtually interchangeable. Yeah, same that's same true. story. Good point. So, uh, yeah, Platoon was a good movie. That was a big college movie for me. I watched that a lot. Yeah. All right, we're rambling, so that means we should take a break, and Jerry will uh, get us back in order. I think I said Platoon is a good movie. Stuff you should know. Hey, you want to look good in your underwear and be comfortable, right? Correct. Well, that's kind of a tough balance to strike, Chuck, right? Well, not for me undies, it's not. No, that's true, because, friends, if you go to MeUndies.com, you can find yourself the best pair of underwear you've ever owned. And I got to say, fellas, MeUndies Diamond Seam Pouch gives you all the support you need in all the right places without feeling too tight. And, ladies, you're going to love the soft, eco-friendly fabric, as do I. And if you don't, well, MeUndies has you covered with the 100% satisfaction guarantee. They guarantee you will love your MeUndies or your money back. Yeah, and I bet you they don't give a lot of money back because they bet. are so comfy. I'm right there with you. All right, and right now it gets even better. MeUndies has an exclusive offer for listeners to Stuff You Should Know. You can get 20% off that first pair and free shipping. Yep, go to MeUndies.com. Right now, for 20% off and free shipping and their 100% satisfaction guarantee. That's MeUndies.com slash stuff. MeUndies.com slash stuff right now. All right, Chuck, let's head on over to uh, Tanganyika. You also mean, known as Tanzania. You mean Tanzania. But uh, back in 1962, it was known as Tanganyika. That's right. And um, in Tan- Tanganyika, there was a boarding school, a girls' boarding school, so you can understand what's about to happen there. Sure. And some girls started to giggle. And apparently it wasn't like a happy giggle. It was like a nervous giggle, you know, like anxious laughter. Yeah. And it started to spread. Yes, which is normal enough. Giggling is like the church giggles. You ever heard of that? Uh-huh. It's contagious. Hard to stop. Yes. And that's usually if you're in a place where you shouldn't be laughing and you can't contain it. Right. And then your friend starts laughing and you can't contain it and you have to go excuse yourself. Yeah. And then you never go back in the room. So this supposedly lasted, though, for like six months. Six months to a year and a half, spreading all over the place, depending on who you ask. Uh, uncontrollable and contagious laughter. Uh, they had to shut down the school Yeah, for two months. And then they're like, okay, surely it's over. And they opened it back up, started right back up. So this one bothered me a little bit because, 
you, you can't just constantly giggle and laugh. No, and it's that's impossible. Th- I read this this interview with a guy. Um, I read the same one. The the Chicago Tribune interview. Yeah. So the, I think he made a pretty good point. He was saying like there's very there's a lot of misinformation about this. First of all, it's called a laughter epidemic. So people just think like it's like the Monty Python world's funniest joke skit or right. something, right? Um, that's not the case. It was again. It was not joyful laughter. It was anxious laughter. And then there were plenty of other symptoms too. There was crying. There was pain. There was fainting. Rashes. Uh, yeah. Um, and there was definitely laughter, and it definitely did spread. But it wasn't just like constant laughter. Yeah, it would come and go. Yeah. And um, it did. It did last for at least six months, and it did spread to other villages because when these girls who were at this boarding school away from home were sent home because the school was shut down, they actually took it with them to their other villages, which suggests that the stress that um, kicked this off yeah. was not just at the boarding school, that it was larger than that. And around this time, Tanzania was uh, had gained independence, yeah. so there was a lot of anxiety about what the future held. Yeah. So it started at the school where the girls were apparently very challenged academically, and then uh, it spread through the stress of, you know, what what's the future going to bring? Right. That's the, that's the official line that this one linguist has come up with. I believe it. That one's not so great. No, I think that's one of the off-sighted examples, though, of a genuine mass psychogenic yeah. illness, you know? Yeah. Because it, 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 the fact that it spread from outside of a tiny boarding school yeah. into the larger, into villages out, outside of yeah, it. Yeah, that's it's, weird. Yeah. That's a tense situation. It is very tense. Uh, the West Bank fainting epidemic of 1983, uh, that spring, um, about a thousand young Arabs in the West Bank started feeling sick. And uh, <clears throat> like a lot of these cases, it's like dizziness, headache, uh, weird stomach pains. It's like things that you can't really put a finger on yeah. as far as tracing it back, like, well, this must be something. Uh, and so, of course, because of where it was, uh, and then these were young schoolgirls, largely 70 percent were 12 to 17 years old. Mm-hmm. So because of where it was in the world, uh, Palestinian leaders started saying, you know what? Israelis are using chemical warfare against us. Yeah, because the first kids to fall ill had reported smelling like a foul odor, kind of like rotten eggs. Sure. And if you're in that part of the world, you got kids breaking out in rashes and, yeah. and uh, stomach pain and blurred vision and they're smelling something funny. Yep. That's a pretty logical conclusion to come to. And so the Israelis countered back with, if there's any chemical warfare being used, you guys are using it on your own people so you can blame us. Right. So these kids fell ill from the smell, and all of a sudden, Palestine and Israel are like publicly going at it, accusing one another of using chemical warfare on their own on, on Arab kids. Yes. This is a big deal when this happened. It was a big deal, and it could have escalated uh, to who knows what. But um, the fact is, there was nothing going on at all. It was another case of mass collective hysteria. Uh, they closed schools in the West Bank. Um, <clears throat> no one else got sick. Uh, they they searched all the buildings and the schools, and they found no chemical residue, no malfeasance going on whatsoever. They found a smelly bathroom, though. <laughs> and they think that might have been the source of the initial foul smell. Yeah. That kicked it all off. A stinky bathroom. Some boy uh, <laughs> went into the Hurt Locker. <laughs> <laughs> he logged out. That was a reference to a listener mail, by the way. I know. And somebody else wrote in, the best one, in my opinion, logged out. I was like, you won. Logged out for taking a poop? Yeah. I got to go log out. Oh, that's okay. I got it. Ugh. That's pretty good. It is good. It that really brings it, it grows into the information you. age. It does. It's relevant. It's like that Simpsons. I think I just logged on to my internet. <laughs> Do you remember? Was that Ralph? No, it was um, Carl went back when they were kids. Oh. <laughs> when they can't figure out why Homer's having a mental breakdown, it's because he discovered a dead body years ago and then repressed the memory. Uh-huh. And Carl's talking about the internetting on his bathing suit. <laughs> and then later on he goes, I think I just logged on to my internet. So great. And so, this one's been uh, all over the place, huh? They, uh, they blame the West Bank uh, fainting epidemic on stress and anxiety. Uh, and then, of course, there were news reports of the toxic gas, and so right. that's why it spread. And, uh, Chuck, we could do this all day, but we're not going to. Let's bring it home with one more. So in Portugal, uh, in May of 2006, 
there was a, a teen soap opera called Saved by the Bell <laughs> called Morangos Calm Azucar. That's my Portuguese. What do you think? Pretty good. I mean, Strawberries with Sugar. It was the name of the, uh, the, the teen show. Delicious. And in May of 2006, the show aired an episode where this mysterious illness was striking kids down left and right. And the source of the disease was at school. It was being spread at school. It was a virus. And all of a sudden, kids in the real world who were watching Strawberries with Sugar started to come down with a very strangely similar disease. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we said it was in 2006. I did say. All right. Well... Let's drive that home, because that was a big year. <laughs> um, was that the year we started our show? No, 2007, oh, okay. 8, 2008. 2008. All right. but We've we, been at it since 2008. That's crazy. Year 8, man. Who knew that we would one day be veterans of a medium? Old, Isn't that crazy? aged veterans. Yeah? Like, I didn't say we were good around ones. on our porch with our... <laughs> Confederate pistols under our blankets. That's right. Uh, so these kids were uh, not only at one school, they were at 14 different schools around the country, which was a little different than most cases because usually it's like starts in this one school. Right. But that's because the clear cause of this was this television show that kids loved all over the country. The Vector. Yeah. Was this episode of a TV show. <laughs> Absolutely. And luckily the um, – the Portuguese um, authorities, health authorities, they did some investigating and they figured out that, oh, this is mass psychogenic illness. Pretty interesting stuff. Agreed. And they said uh, what the kids are really stressed about are final exams. Well, they think it started with some kids who had actual allergies and had seen this yeah. episode and started worrying that their own allergies were actually a symptom of a disease. Right. That spread to kids who were basically going along with it be out of stress from exams. Yeah. The, the good thing about this one is because it was 2006, you can go on the Internet and look at uh, their articles. You like, can log on to your Internet. You can log on to your Internet and look up art- articles that are like, is the, is the strawberries with sugar virus real? Yeah. Like people were writing into newspapers. Yeah. You know, my kid is having these symptoms. Like, is it a real thing? Did they... Or did they just make this up? And it still goes on. I mean, apparently this these so there's two kinds basically. There's motor um, illness, and then there's anxiety. And anxiety is more like fainting, upset stomach, headache, right. motors where you're twitching and meowing and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but there's supposedly hundreds of these cases around the world every year. They happen a lot. Maybe it'll come to your town if you're lucky. Join right in, I say. Yeah. Just meow and bite the night away. Let it loose for a week. Uh, if you want to know more about mass hysterias, go listen to What is Collective Hysteria, our other episode, and then uh, you can search for mass hysteria also in the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com. Since I said also, it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this long overdue. I printed this one out months ago and told Georgia that I was going to read it, and I forgot. Okay. It's about the fairy tales. All right. Uh, hedge, hedge. My name is Georgia. I live in Stockholm. Hedge, hedge. I think hedge, hedge is hey, hey. Sure. In Swedish. Uh, Stockholm, Sweden? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we did another good episode on Stockholm syndrome. That's right. Man, that was a good one. A.K.A. the Swedish delight. <laughs> sure. That's what the cops call it. Well, he's got the Swedish delight. <laughs> My name is Georgia, and I live in Stockholm. I've been listening to your show for a few years, and I love it. I recently listened to the Dark Fairy Tales episode, and I asked my husband about the term Aschenputtel, since he's German, and I often use Disney movies to help teach me Swedish. Uh, he figured out that it's kind of a play on words that implies a scullery maid covered in ashes. Aschen is ash, as opposed to cinder, which is incorrectly used in the English name, since if you were covered in cinders, you'd have severe burns, as it is pieces of burning slag. It's true. Uh, it is translated from the French word for ashes, which is cinder. Uh, Putel doesn't exist in German, he says. Uh, I, I don't know. That sounds so German to me. Sounds pretty German. Uh, but the term for scullion or kitchen helper is Aschenbrödel. I'm so glad you took German. <laughs> Though this is uh, the male form. He thinks Aschenputel is... It sounds like words are just growing in your mouth. <laughs> like, you know those dinosaurs you can get wet and they turn into giant sponge dinosaurs? No, but I do know the little lead pellets that you would light that would grow into big snakes. Close enough. 
Those are what are growing in your mouth when you're saying German words. He thinks Aschenputtel is kind of a feminine <laughs> version of Aschenbrudel, since German is nonsensical and gendered. Huh. Uh, her words. Hope this information is still interesting to you guys. Her in bra dog hedge da. Hedge hedge, Georgia, thanks a lot. That was a, an extraordinarily intelligent listener mail, and we appreciate it. <laughs>